Long ago, a feline came to the flooded forest seeking a giant fish of lore, but he was tailed by a meddlesome Melinx. When the feline wasn't looking, the Melinx snatched his bags, leaving him with nothing but a single piece of meat. Change is the language of nature. Whenever the threat of stagnation emerges, whenever stability transitions into inertia, change occurs. All of nature, be it environments or creatures, changes constantly, by accident, by circumstance, or by intent. While some changes are hard and painful, they are ultimately the force that propel us forward, the fuel on which the eternal engine of life runs forevermore. But some places experience more change than others. In fact, some areas of our planet are defined by the propensity for transformation. One such place is the flooded forest. Originally discovered by the hunters of Tanzia, this tropical area experiences regular floods, causing much of it to sink into deep swaths of muddy water. This rhythm of flooding has shaped the terrain significantly, the water having sheared through the land and created steep valleys where it tends to flow through. The forest is thus highly porous, with underground rivers, holes in the terrain in which new vegetation sprouts, and high, lone hills, isolated by their resistance to water. The Hunter's Guild regulates activity in the area based on the forest's state. When the forest is fully flooded during peak humid season, any quests pertaining to the flooded forests are sent over to Moga and Tanzia, whose hunters are uniquely trained in underwater combat. During the dry season, when the forest is slightly less flooded, quests are sent to a more diverse roster of villages, first and foremost Kamura, which is fairly close to the hunting ground and thus more convenient to send quests to. Whenever hunters are unavailable, the Flooded Forest Guard patrols the area, a band of mercenaries tasked with pushing any dangerous beasts back into the forest, should they try to migrate into other habitats. They are, however, notoriously ineffective at this, as per their own comment, they do not get paid enough. Either way, activity in this area remains strong, as the ores found in this submerged forest, especially underwater, are not just durable and strong, but also, paradoxically, extremely easy to work with and malleable, making them exceptionally valuable to blacksmiths and thus an attractive reason for both the guild and other militarized organizations to explore the area and exploit the minerals and ores that are found here. During these bouts of exploration, the guild discovered numerous ruins and pyramids. These suggest a thriving past civilization once lived here but they also tell us much about the land in a broader sense. Most of these monuments are built on what are now lonesome hills and cliffs, meaning that they were probably created before the water carved up the land, when these hills were easily accessible and interconnected. This implies that the phenomenon of the forest flooding regularly only started somewhat recently, at some point between today and the building of those pyramids. The guild stresses, however, that this is just an hypothesis and not an official archaeological statement. Now, only ruins remain. And among those ruins, many curious creatures dwell, ready to ruin any efforts to reach the valuable ores of the forest. One of the most common species found in the flooded forest are the rogi, a type of bird wyvern. Like many raptorial bird wyverns, the Rogi live in packs, which claim and hold sizable territories within the forest. Rogi are one of the few bird wyverns that are not covered in hard overlapping scales. Instead, similar to the Ayo, the Rogi have a smooth, moist hide. This makes them less armored than some of their cousins, but it grants them water repellent properties, 
meaning that they don't have to worry about the humidity rotting their skin or introducing bacteria into their bodies. This hide is bright orange, a coloration easily recognizable as a warning signal. Look at me, I am dangerous, do not approach. In the Ragi's case, this warning is bolstered by their main weapon, which they always have on full display. A pair of massive, translucent poison sacs at either ends of their heads. These organs produce a toxic mist which can be funneled into the Ragi's throat to spit out small puffs of highly venomous gas, easily perishing most uppity adversaries. Their apparent size, as well as the fact that the poison mixture within can at times be clearly seen through the translucent skin, are all meant to deter attackers. All this by itself makes Rogi packs fairly dangerous. But this danger goes from bad to worse once one encounters the boss. At a certain age, male Rogi leave the pack in order to wander the wetlands alone for some time. This solitude, as well as the connected hardships, trigger a rush of hormones that transform the young male into a great Rogi. Twice the size of a regular Rogi, the two poison sacs fused into a single massive one around the wyvern's throat, the great Rogi returns home and rounds up its own pack, made up of females and young males. It reigns as pack leader, its venom now many times more potent, ready to defend its flock. Its more articulate snout can now be used to issue command to its brethren, making it a true leader. This allows for coordinated attacks, which, combined with their poison abilities, makes a pack of Rogi a serious problem. Their strongest weapon is however also their obvious weak spot. The translucency of their poison sacs gives away just how thin the membrane is, and it can be easily damaged. While tearing a Rogi's poison sack will not disable them entirely, a torn sack cannot be contracted effectively, meaning that it cannot build up enough pressure to shoot their poison out, meaning that their poison mist will only be huffed out very sheepishly, with none of the distance and concentration they ought to have. Defeated, the feline collapsed in frustration when he realized that there was a hungry snake right under his nose. The feline tore off some meat for the snake, and it hissed happily, Feed the stream, and it will feed you. While the Rogi roam the woodlands freely, many areas within the flooded forest are still inaccessible to them. Their hide may be water repellent, but besides that, they do not have any advanced aquatic mobility, and are sure to drown if they fall into the muddy depths of the locale. No, within the waters of the flooded forest, a different species dominates, another social pack animal which flitters and swims in the murky abyss without restraint. If there was one species that is the most associated with the flooded forest, it would have to be the Ludroth. These yellow leviathans are opportunistic omnivores, scooping up any food they can find in their watery homes. Their skin is moist and semi-permeable, like that of frogs and other amphibians. This, in conjunction with their long slender body, their fin-like hind legs, and the sail at the end of their tails, makes the Ludroth excellent swimmers, and they indeed reign supreme in the flooded parts of the forest. They are, however, not entirely aquatic. They have no gills and must surface in order to breathe. Luckily, Ludroth are still somewhat agile on land, their moist skin and flexible bodies allowing for speedy traversal across various types of terrain. The only danger to them is that of drying out. Their skin must remain humid, otherwise it may shrivel, crack, and even kill the creature. To circumvent this, Ludroth have developed a unique adaptation. Along their necks sit special cells which grow a highly porous, absorbent kind of tissue, very similar to that of a sponge. This tissue sucks up water while the Ludroth is submerged, storing it. 
When the Ludroth then ventures on land, its sponge serves as a constant moisturizer that gradually releases its water and lets it flow across the creature's skin, thus preventing drying out for extended periods of time that it must spend on land. The slender, small Ludroth many visitors to the flooded forest are familiar with are actually the female version. The Ludroth is a non-fisherian species, meaning it does not follow Fisher's principle. This biological concept states that because evolution always favors efficiency, most species with distinct sexes will evolve to generally have an equal number of males and females, as that evenly distributes the burden of procreation. Fisherian species, therefore, will generally have a sex ratio of 1 to 1, or at least approaching it. Ludroth, however, are overwhelmingly female, with males only being born extremely rarely. These males exhibit significant sexual dimorphism, becoming much larger than females and, upon reaching maturity, developing a massive mane of sponge. These males are called Royal Ludroths. Their increased size and elongated claws make them excellent fighters, and they use that fact to amass, maintain, and protect a personal harem of female Ludroths. When a threat approaches, the massive Royal Ludroth can defend its wives in many ways. It can simply crash into an attacker at full speed, fastened by its slippery skin, or swipe at them with its sharp claws, or even just bite them, as Ludroth have a tremendous bite force. Should that not be enough, the Royal Ludroth sponge can also serve as a weapon. By expelling water from it explosively, the Royal Ludroth can push enemies back. It can also mix the water from its sponge with mucus produced in its mouth to spit globules of foam that incapacitate foes. Ludroths mate in the summer, and it is an exhausting time for the male. The Royal Ludroth must mate with its entire harem, but more crucially, it must then continuously collect and share water from its sponge with the pregnant females, to prevent them from dying of heat exhaustion in the summer sun, as they, once they're gravid, generally stay on land until they are ready to lay their eggs. This is, in fact, believed to be the sponge main's primary purpose, to hydrate the Ludroth's harem. Confused, the feline nevertheless threw his last morsel into the stream. Then, suddenly, thousands of fish appeared. It was not the mythic creature he'd sought, but he was delighted anyway, and filled his pockets to the brim. Rogi and Ludroth make up the majority of the flooded forest's inhabitants, as they are both immensely successful pack species in their respective habitats. To see other creatures, one must venture deep into the forest, past the flooded plains and crumbling pyramids. If one is lucky, or rather, supremely unfortunate, one might then encounter a monster like the Almudron. This enormous leviathan is generally reclusive and avoids humans as much as possible. Thus, it is a rare sight. They are however not cowardly or avoidant, and will retaliate mercilessly against anyone who trespasses in their swamp. Almodron are mud dwellers, and spend much of their time submerged in the mire. Their long whiskers can sense vibrations through the goop, which is how the Almodron finds both prey and rivals. Once it senses that someone has entered its territory, the Leviathan emerges to defend its land. Like all Leviathans, the Almodron has a long and slender body, with an exceptionally long tail. Every part of the Almodron is adapted to a life in the mud. Its body is covered in tough, grey scales that protect the beast from tooth and claw, but more importantly, they form ridges and spines that help the Almodron dive into the mud more easily, a prominent example being the creature's scaly hood. Its front legs consist of toe pads that keep the leviathan above the mud and sharp claws that aid in plunging deeper into it, giving the Almodron full control over its position in the muck. But most impressively, the beast's tail ends in a bizarre assortment of articulate red fins covered in light adhesive. 
These fins serve to manipulate and shape the mud, turning the tail into a terraforming limb. Through all of these adaptations, the Almudron has become a master of mudbound combat. A swipe of its tail creates waves, the stirring of its limbs rumbles the mire, and its long body and hard scales crush opponents. But what if an enemy tries to fight the Almudron where there is no mud? While it is somewhat rare, the Almudron can find itself out of its element occasionally. But the Lord of the Swamp has one more trump card, and what a weapon it is. At the tip of its tail, between its mud fins, the Almodon possesses pores which secrete a golden fluid. This liquid is extremely corrosive and can, when funneled into the ground, turn solid earth into muddy slush. Thus, the Almodron is never far from its swamp, as it can turn any ground into mire at will. Its golden fluid can also freely be mixed with the mud it creates to form golden mud, which burns those it touches due to the corrosive fluid within. When enraged, the Almodron will start oozing with this golden fluid and inject it into all of the mud around it and the mud that it uses. At the same time, it will begin forming a hardened mud sphere with its tail fins, which can then be used as a giant, golden, corrosive wrecking ball. The Almudron doesn't just have these abilities for violence, however. When in heat, male Almudron will search for a female to court. That courtship behavior entails an intense and downright competitive terraforming dance in which both Almudron use all of their abilities to create elaborate mud structures to impress one another. The Almudron mating season essentially transforms the land around them. Luckily, the structures they build are not particularly stable and go away after a while, which makes them and the actual courtship behavior extremely rare and valuable to witness as long as the Almudron doesn't turn on the observer right after. The greedy Melinx, seeing this, said to itself, If I throw in a bunch, I'll get even more fish back for myself. He gathered a heap of meat and tossed it all in, only to be greeted by the gaping maw of the legendary giant fish. While the Almudron is reclusive, its presence is felt in the entire forest, as it is the uncontested ruler of the mud and the deep. Well, almost uncontested. In the flooded forest dwells one other species that can rival the Almudron, and coincidentally, it is the Almudron's closest existing relative, the Mizutsune, a leviathan that belongs to the same suborder as Almudron, Sea Beast Wyvern. The Mizutsune is nonetheless quite different from its cousin. While its claws and tail do resemble those of the Almudron quite closely, the general look of the Mizutsune is drastically different. Unlike most leviathans, and most wyverns for that matter, the Mizutsune is covered in not just fish-like scales, but thick, purple fur in select spots of its body. In addition, Male Mizutsune grow numerous colorful fins all across their body, most notably on their back and as part of a head crest. Female Mizutsune live in small colonies, while male Mizutsune tend to spend most of their time alone. All of them are, however, like their cousin the Almudron, isolationists who would rather nap in peace than fight and struggle. They can, and sometimes will, hunt large prey. But more often than not, Mizutsune are happy to rely on a fish-based diet, lazily grabbing snacks out of the bodies of water they call home. While they are not fully aquatic and spend most of their time on land, Mizutsune prefer living near large bodies of water, where they generally live a peaceful and quiet life. In fact, it would almost be accurate to say that Mizutsune are harmless. Almost. During breeding season, male Mizutsune undergo a frightening transformation in their temper. Driven into a hormonal frenzy, they begin terrorizing their habitats, picking fights with anything that moves. This is why the overwhelming majority of Mizutsune cited by humans are males in heat looking for trouble. 
These Mizutsune pose a significant threat, mainly due to their unrivaled mobility. Within their fur coats and scale armors, the Mizutsune produces a slippery, soap-like fluid that it finds many uses for, called bubble foam. For one, males coat their fins in this fluid, which makes the already sensitive membranes even better at picking up vibrations through both air and water, pinpointing the frenzied male's next victim. But more worryingly, this bubble foam can cover the creature's body and allow the Mizutsune to slip and slide across terrain effortlessly. Just like the Almudron, the Mizutsune's feet also consist of pads and claws. The pads allow it to rapidly slide using its soapy liquid, while the claws function as emergency brakes, giving this leviathan extremely sophisticated control over its movements. All the benefits of sliding, with none of the downsides. One side effect of using bubble foam is that it often forms large soap bubbles as it rubs against the Mizutsune's fur coat, but even this can work to the monster's advantage. Should a bubble pop and cover its victim in foam and soapy liquid, that victim is essentially left helpless, slipping and sliding uncontrollably while the Mizutsune has full control over its movements. Older Mizutsune eventually figure this out and begin intentionally forming and launching these bubbles as part of their attack strategies. They even develop the skill to produce bubbles directly from their mouths by using the foam pores that sit on their face. Once in an advantageous position, the Mizutsune can also stimulate an internal water organ to spew a highly pressurized beam of water from its mouth, concentrated enough to cut through armor. This danger is why being able to read a Mizutsune's mood and intentions is so important. Luckily, the fins on the males give those intentions away. They change color depending on the beast's mood and state, and they may be related to heart rate, although that has not been confirmed. A pink fin Mizutsune is of a calm temper, while a blue fin indicates fatigue or drowsiness. Meanwhile, red fins indicate excitement, aggression, and danger. Thus. Should a hunter encounter a red fin Mizutsune, they are to immediately evacuate. The Mealings took one look at that monster and fled for its life, dropping the feline's belongings in the process. And so, having seen the fabled fish, the feline thanked its serpentine friend and set off in search of new adventures. The flooded forest is home to numerous extraordinary creatures. Over time, this habitat has not just changed its shape, but that of its tenants as well, as the unique combination of both woodlands and marshes creates challenges that require specific solutions. Such is the unrelenting beat of nature's drum. Adapt or die. Even if the world floods around you, if the ground corrodes beneath your feet, move forward and be open to change, to transform, be flexible and remain alive. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you like this video, consider subscribing and supporting the channel that way. Like it, share it, Whatever works for you, I'll be grateful either way. And of course, a very special thank you to all our patrons over on Patreon, including Fiction Ape, Sini, Claire Meboon, Grexian, Geo, Jameson Tate, Makot O2, Mr. Pyramid, Mr. Meander, Paracha, Pede Fuego, Pero Scoco, Person 212, Project Iceman, Vulgar Beast, Oak Wood Tree, Iron Camel, and Courage. You guys are the best, and I'll see you around next time. Bye bye.